In this video, we're picking up where we left off in our previous discussion, and we'll be exploring the fascinating concept of frictional force. In our last video, we took a deep dive into the world of objects gliding smoothly on a frictionless surface. If you need to get up to speed on the basics of how things move on a smooth surface, I highly recommend checking out that previous video. By the time you finish watching this video, you'll have a much better handle on what frictional force is all about. We'll also unravel the meanings of the static and kinetic friction coefficients, demystify the concept of the limiting force, and show you how to apply Newton's second law to tackle problems involving friction. The frictional force is the result of the interaction between two surfaces that come into contact and slide against each other. This force is primarily influenced by the texture of the surfaces and the magnitude of the force pressing them together. The angle and position of the object also play a role in determining the level of frictional force. To clarify this idea, let's take the example of an object with mass m resting on a rough surface. This object experiences a gravitational force, mg, directed downward due to its weight. As a result of the object's weight pressing onto the surface it rests on, the table exerts an equal and opposite force on the object, which is typically denoted as n, or commonly referred to as the normal force. A force f of a is applied to the object, through a weight attached to a string, as shown on the screen. The frictional force acts in opposition to the applied force, thereby keeping the object from moving. This frictional force acts parallel to the surface, but in the opposite direction of the applied force, with its magnitude being equal to that of the applied force. With the gradual increase in the applied force, a critical point is eventually reached, where the frictional force becomes inadequate to keep the object stationary, leading to its acceleration. The maximum force needed for the object to initiate acceleration is commonly referred to as the limiting force of friction. At this point, the frictional force is equal to the limiting force of friction. The magnitude of the frictional force is directly proportional to the force exerted by the object on the surface it is in contact with, which we commonly call the normal force. The frictional force is also determined by the texture of the contact surfaces. Therefore, we can express the frictional force as shown on the screen. This specific constant is known as the coefficient of static friction, as it is applicable only when the object is at rest. The coefficient of static friction is a dimensionless constant, and its value is dependent on the texture of the surfaces in contact. Finally, we can express the limiting force of friction as shown on the screen. However, if the applied force is less than the limiting frictional force, the frictional force is correspondingly less than the limiting frictional force. As clarified in the previous explanation, the limiting frictional force is equal to the product of the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. In simpler terms, the object will remain stationary as long as the frictional force remains less than the product of the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. This is an essential condition to remember when tackling problems related to static frictional force. However, when the applied force is equal to the product of the normal force and the coefficient of static friction, the object will start to accelerate. We will explore this in more detail in the following discussion. So, when we apply a bit more force than the limiting frictional force, that's when the object gets going. But here's the interesting part. Once it starts moving, it doesn't need as much force to keep it going. What this tells us is that the force required to maintain the motion of an object on a surface with friction is less than the initial force needed to get it going. In simpler terms, when the object is already in motion, the friction it encounters is less than what initially held it back. Now, Here's the key, the amount of friction depends on how hard those surfaces are pushed together, or, in more technical terms, the normal force. To put it more scientifically, we can express this relationship with a constant of proportionality, known as the coefficient of kinetic friction.
this coefficient varies based on how rough or smooth those two surfaces are. And it's worth noting that this equation applies specifically when the object is already in motion on a surface with friction. Remember when we talked about the limiting force earlier? Well, now we know that when the object is actually moving, that limiting force is actually more than the frictional force it's experiencing. So, that tells us that the coefficient of static friction is actually higher than the coefficient of kinetic friction. Before we proceed with the video, I would greatly appreciate it if you could kindly give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and activate the notification bell. Your support means a lot. Thank you. Now, let's get back to the video. Let's examine this example to grasp the fundamental application of friction. We have a 10 kilogram object placed on a rough surface with a static friction coefficient of 0.7 and a kinetic friction coefficient of 0.6. First, we want to figure out the maximum force of friction that can keep it from moving. Then, we'll see how the object accelerates when we apply a 100 Newton force to it. The free body diagram of the object is shown on the screen. Given the absence of acceleration in the direction of the normal force, we can determine that the normal force has a value of 98 Newton. We understand that the object initiates motion when the applied force equals the limiting frictional force. Limiting frictional force is equivalent to the frictional force just as the object is on the brink of movement. The connection between the limiting frictional force and the normal force is described by this expression. Because the object is currently stationary, we use the coefficient of static friction in this equation. Now we will substitute the given coefficient of static friction value and the calculated normal force value into this equation to ascertain the force required to exceed friction. This force represents the limiting force of friction. Next, we will determine the acceleration of the object when a 100 Newton force is applied to it. To calculate this acceleration, we apply Newton's second law in the direction of the applied force. The net force in the direction of acceleration is determined by the vector sum of forces acting in the same direction as expressed here. Before we dive into Newton's second law, we need to figure out the frictional force. When we apply a 100 Newton force, the object starts moving and experiences an acceleration. But what's the force pushing back against this motion? To find out, we use this equation. It's worth noting that we use this equation when the object is already in motion, so we apply the coefficient of kinetic friction. Once we plug in the coefficient of kinetic friction and the normal force into this equation, we find that the frictional force opposing the object's motion amounts to 58.8 Newton. Now, we can determine the resultant force in the direction of acceleration, which amounts to 41.2 Newton. Moving forward, we can plug in this computed net force into Newton's second law to ascertain the acceleration of the object which is measured at 4.12 meters per square second. In our next example, we'll examine a 10 kilogram object as it moves down a ramp, inclined at 30 degrees relative to the horizontal. There's a kinetic friction coefficient of 0.3 between the surfaces. Our goal is to determine the acceleration of this object as it slides down the ramp. Let me guide you through the process of sketching the free body diagram for this example. The major force at play here is the weight of the object, pulling it downward due to gravity. This weight puts pressure on the surface below, and in response, the surface pushes back with an equal and opposite force. This opposing force is what we call the normal force, and it acts perpendicular to the surface where the object is in contact. As the object moves down the inclined plane, it undergoes acceleration. Yet, this motion encounters resistance from the frictional force. Operating in the opposite direction to the object's movement, the frictional force hinders and opposes its sliding motion. What you're looking at on the screen is a visual representation of this free body diagram, showing these forces and their directions. In this free body diagram, 
the vectors aren't perpendicular. To apply Newton's second law, we need to break down these vectors into two directions, making sure each is at right angles to the other. This approach simplifies the problem-solving process. My recommendation is to select the direction of motion as one of these, with the other being perpendicular to it. By doing so, we can streamline the analysis by concentrating on the motion in one direction, thereby ignoring the motion in the other direction. The frictional force lines up with the acceleration, and the normal force points in the direction perpendicular to the acceleration. Weight, on the other hand, doesn't line up with either of these directions. So, we have to break down the weight vector to find its components in the direction of acceleration, and perpendicular to it. The resolved weight vectors are displayed on the screen. The initial step is to determine the normal force, to subsequently calculate the frictional force. Once we have this information, we can use Newton's second law to find the acceleration, in the direction of motion. Now, let's apply Newton's second law, in the direction of the normal force. Since the object doesn't move in the direction of the normal force, the acceleration in that direction is zero. The expression of Newton's second law is displayed on the screen. With this information, we can calculate the value of the normal force, which is determined to be 84.87 Newton. The frictional force can be calculated as the product of the normal force, and the coefficient of kinetic friction. Expressing it as shown on the screen, we find that the frictional force is 25.46 Newton. With all the necessary information, we can now apply Newton's second law, in the direction of motion to determine the acceleration of the object. The expression resulting from this application is displayed on the screen. Upon solving this equation, we find that the acceleration of the object is 2.35 meters per square second. Let's delve into the motion of two objects, each with a weight of 10 kilograms, attached to either side of a string. The object at the far end of the ramp is descending, while the object attached to the other end of the rope is sliding up on the ramp. The ramp itself is inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal, and the coefficient of static friction for the contacting surfaces is specified as 0.3. Our goal is to calculate the acceleration of both objects. The image displayed on the screen, represents the free body diagram of the two objects. We have the option to approach this problem by considering each of these objects separately, or by treating both as a single system. When dealing with a system of two objects, moving in different directions, it's essential to consider the direction of acceleration specific to each object. In this case, the acceleration of object A, is along the plane, while the acceleration of object B, is directed towards gravity. Unlike gravitational acceleration, which is universally applied, acceleration due to other forces, should be considered relative to the particular object in question. Now that we've clarified this, let's proceed to decompose the vectors of these two objects, in the direction of acceleration, and perpendicular to the direction of acceleration. In this case, our focus will be on decomposing the weight vector, of object A, as it is the only vector not aligned with any of the specified directions. Now, we have a choice. We can either delve into the analysis by looking at each object on its own, extracting the needed information step by step. Or, we can take a unified approach, treating both objects as a single system, to get the required information. To begin, we'll consider each object individually, and apply Newton's second law in the direction of acceleration, and perpendicular to acceleration for each respective object. In the next session, we will shift our focus to both objects, and apply Newton's second law to the entire system. Let's go step by step. Starting with object A, we'll apply Newton's second law in the direction of acceleration, resulting in equation 1. Following that, we'll apply Newton's second law in the direction perpendicular to acceleration. Upon solving this expression, we find the value for the normal force to be 84.87 Newton.
Moving on to object B, we'll repeat the process by applying Newton's second law, in the direction of acceleration, leading to equation 3. Object A is sliding on the ramp against the frictional force F of R. We can express this frictional force as a product of the coefficient of kinetic friction, and the normal force, as demonstrated on the screen. Following that, we will substitute the values for the coefficient of kinetic friction, and the normal force into this expression, resulting in the specific value for the frictional force. Next, we will substitute the obtained value of the frictional force into equation 1, and derive the corresponding expression. This resultant expression will be labeled as expression 4. By adding expressions 3, and 4, we arrive at a combined expression that now contains only one unknown, the acceleration of the two objects. Upon solving this equation, we find that the value for acceleration is 1.18 meters per square second. In this segment, we will consider both weights together as one system, and apply Newton's second law to determine the acceleration of the objects. To find the net force applied to the system in the direction of acceleration, let's analyze the forces acting on each object separately. For object A, the decomposed components of weight, friction, and tension are the forces influencing its motion. For object B, weight and tension are the forces affecting its motion in the direction of acceleration. However, since tension is an internal force when considering the entire system, its net effect on the whole system is nullified. Therefore, we are left with only these forces to consider. In this expression, friction is the only unknown component. We can apply the same approach as before, to find the value for friction. Following these calculations, we determine the value for friction as 25.46 Newton. Let's proceed. We will substitute the calculated value of friction 25.46 Newton into equation 1, and determine the value for the net force in the direction of acceleration. The result is 23.54 Newton. While each object experiences a different direction of acceleration when considered independently, when connected by a string, assuming it does not sag or stretch, the magnitudes of their accelerations are the same. The difference in the direction of acceleration is attributed to the pulley. When analyzing the acceleration for the entire system, we treat the direction as applicable to each object separately, considering it as the positive direction. We then calculate the net force in the direction of acceleration. Importantly, we don't account for the forces applied between the objects, as they get negated in the overall system analysis. To find the total mass, you can sum up all the masses in the system using this equation. By substituting specific values for the masses of each object into this equation, you can calculate the total mass of the system. Mass is a scalar quantity. Therefore, when calculating the total mass of the system, you simply add up all the individual masses without considering their orientation. By applying Newton's second law to the system, considering the net force and the total mass, we can find the value for acceleration. It's fantastic that the result aligns with the previous calculation, confirming the consistency of the analysis. I'm glad we could work through the concepts related to forces, accelerations, and systems. Looking forward to exploring the concepts of simple harmonic motion in the next video. Thank you for watching the video until the end. I trust you found it informative and valuable. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel for more content. If you have any questions or if there's anything else you'd like to discuss, feel free to reach out. Until we meet again in the next video,
take care, and goodbye.